Hello everyone, this is Chris Mackey and welcome to your introductory video on honeybee energy modeling. This is just, this is the first video in a very long series that, that, that we've, we've put together for you guys here. Um, and it's, it's this, in this video we're just going to give you a very broad overview of what, all the things that we're going to cover in here. We're not going to delve into rhino or grasshopper yet. This is just to give you a sense of, of, of the stuff that you will find in this series. Um, that is on honeybee energy modeling. Um, but just to give you guys a little bit of a, of a, of a overview from the start. Um, sorry, there we go. Um, so honeybee, uh, as you guys may already know, does a lot of different things. I mean, it, it connects rhino grasshopper, this our wonderful uh, 3D geometry interface, to a number of, of, uh, of, of different uh, open source platforms for, for daylighting, Radiance being a rendering engine, DaySim being a a, a tool for evaluating daylight um, and you can also export to, to a GBXML which is becoming a sort of standard for a lot of energy modeling um, but the focus of, of this series is going to be on just on on the connection between Rhino Grasshopper and these two which are which are Energy Plus and Open Studio and these are our projects uh, funded by the Department of Energy that are open source very good ways of, uh, of, of, of energy modeling uh, com full, fully energy modeling buildings um, but now, just to sort of open though, I mean, just to give us some general advice on energy modeling, and I, and I mean, I, I give this just because I know I, I had struggled for the last two years to try and, and integrate energy modeling into my design, and there are just a few things I learned along the way that I, I wish someone had told me sooner when I was starting out, and so I wanted to tell you guys this at the start of, of this video series, just so you guys have a sense of what you're getting into and, and you know, what, what you have to put in and what you'll get out of it. So first thing that I want to would first advice I would give to you is that energy modeling is difficult. That is that is just it's it is it is a fact. It is and any any anyone who tries to tell you otherwise is 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 has not really delved deep into into energy modeling or or, or used it extensively. And the reason why it's difficult is because even the simplest building that you have is subject to a lot of complexity in terms of the weather and can be used in very complex ways by its occupants. And, uh, and it's because of this that, that energy modeling is always going to be a very, um, a very, very complex task that, that involves looking at some details. Um, but, but because of this complexity, you know, even if you have a fast means of setting up energy models, and I will say Honeybee, it can be a very, very fast way of setting up energy models, uh, primarily because it cuts out the, the most time-consuming step of recreating the geometry by virtue of the fact that we're plugged into Rhino. Um, but even though it's very fast, one, you still have to take time to understand all these complex inputs of your model, all these com this complex weather and complex you know, user variables. And two, it'll take a lot of adjusting of these very complex inputs before you trust that your model is an accurate representation of what you will build. And this is, yeah, this is why, I mean, because it, it's relatively easy to just, you know, have a model and run it. But to, to actually trust it and, and, and get something useful out of it is, uh, is a difficult task. Um, and to, to maybe sort of explain this a little more, I were, or maybe just kind of ask, like, if it's so difficult, is it worth it to model at all in the design process? And I will say, uh, you know, there are actually some people who say that, you know, designers maybe shouldn't, shouldn't be energy modeling, if only because it can be a this very difficult, time-consuming task. But I mean, of course, the, the opinions vary widely on this, and, and you can imagine that I fall more on the side that, that yes, yes, as a designer, you can energy model, but, but I would say, I would give this advice in terms of how you model in your design process, or essentially when you, when you start to energy model in your design. Um, and I would say that if, when, you know, you should first make sure that you have gotten some ideas from, you know, just by exploring the climate, I mean, and, and using Ladybug as kind of as, as I suggest here, because we, I mean, we made Ladybug primarily so that you can explore the climate and, you know, and, and find interesting things that you might not otherwise have realized and, and get ideas about strategies and things that you might want to implement on your building. Um, and the thing is, you really, really need these ideas in order to energy model, because the energy model isn't really going to give you the ideas itself. The energy model can tell you whether how good the idea is and, and how much it's working or not working. But really, like these ideas need to come from an exploration pro process that that is you know b better done with with 
visualization tools like those that you'll find in Ladybug. So two, you have ideas from Ladybug. Two, you should have exhausted the usefulness of Ladybug to inform your design. So Ladybug has a lot of different things, you know, that you can just basically use to start testing and, and you know, and, and maybe creating some simple geometries um, around, around stuff in the weather file. So, but I mean, at a certain point, you will exhaust the usefulness of this in, in terms of how it can inform your design. And then, then you can start to energy model. But there's one other requirement, I would say, uh, in terms of using energy modeling successfully in your design process. And that is, you need to do it while you still have enough time to devote to understanding the energy model. And so that you can perform several iterations of this. Uh, and, you know, because that, that's really where you pull the most value out of your energy model. And so, I mean, I give this kind of graph here of a typical traditional design timeline. So really, I mean, like Ladybug is meant more for the brainstorming and schematic design, but probably, you know, sometime pretty early in your design process, right, around schematic design and design development, you can start, that is when you should probably start, start modeling some stuff in Honeybee, if only to test stuff out and, and get a very basic initial model of, of what's going on. And then, and then, you know, by the time you're up to construction documents, then you're using something that you could really model the, the HVAC and a lot of other very like uh, intricate details uh, better, less such as such as Open Studio or, or one of the programs where you can export the GBXML to. So that's that's kind of like that. I mean, this is this is the kind of sweet spot in your design where you should you should be considering energy modeling. So I mean, just to, to I mean explain this more. So I mean, why why is it important to start early like this? I mean, so after you've gotten ideas, but but you know while you still have enough time, why is that time important? And I mean to kind of walk you through it. I mean, what what happens when you try to energy model? I mean, first, okay, you've got your zone geometry that you create in Rhino. You got your geometry of your buildings and, and these and these rooms essentially, which are zones. Um, and you know, and you'll assign all these zone properties like constructions and schedules and the amount the amount of lighting and people in the space and everything using Honeybee. And then you'll you'll change all the properties, you know, because they'll you'll have default properties, but then you have to change all of them to reflect what you will build. And then, and then finally, okay, then, you know, after you've got that, you're ready to run the model and, you know, and you load and visualize the results. And a lot of people say like, okay, that's energy modeling. That's, that's, that's what we have to do in order to do it in our design process. But the reality is, is that almost any time, the, the, the first time that you do, you run through this process with your energy model, almost certainly you're going to get garbage out of the result. And, and I mean, and that's like, I mean, it's, it's just, it happens because, I mean, it's, it's, what you will build is usually something that is is much more complex than than just the defaults of, of what what you're going to be setting. Um, so so the thing is really if you're going to start to to you know pull value out of this, you have to look at those those visualized results and really try and understand them and and understand what's going on in the model, why things are the way they are, and then after you you've understand that, then you can go back again and change some of the properties to to actually reflect what you will build. And you'll probably have to do this several times. Times, uh, in the course of your design until finally you'll get out of this finally you'll get something useful like something that actually represents what you would build and and you know I mean it, at the least you know now you've got something that can tell you how much your energy is going to to be and you know you can bring that to a developer and, and tell them you save this much money on m and and so so you have value there but the thing is is that I mean the value that you pull from just having an accurate representation of, of your model is it nearly as powerful as the value that you will pull once you're able to go back then in, in this final sort of stage of actually designing with the model and you know and now understanding the results and using using your understandings that you gain from this to try a different strategy and you know and this again becomes a cycle and it's in this last part that you really really pull out a lot of value of your model and unfortunately, I mean, I, I feel a lot of the times today, and especially a lot of times in my design process when I first struggled with this, it was, it was a real challenge to get to this final last place. But out of it is, you know, you get a great design. You not only just get a, uh, um, you know, something useful, you get, you get something that really, really improved your design. And to sort of, you know, kind of, kind of visualize how this value, you know, happens on a graph. If you have your value drawn from, from a model on the x-axis versus the time you invested in it on, 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 on the, sorry, the x-axis, and this is the y-axis, then, you know, in the first part when you're just setting up the model, you're kind of going into the red. You're investing a lot of time without, you know, with just getting garbage and not really, you know, necessarily drawing anything out. But as you begin to understand that and work through it, and then you finally get something that is, you know, sort of representative of reality, you're at the break-even line. You're all right. You've, you, the time you've invested is at least paid off in some respect. 
But the thing is, I mean, it's a kind of exponential curve from here because like when you add, once you have that model, then you're able to run through it very fast and pull this, this increasing value out of the model as you use it to really inform your design and make it better. And this is, this is the type of thing that I, I mean, that I want to be seeing in the next five years in, in, you know, in all of design practice. And if, if, if this is what you want to see too, then you're in the right video series right now because that, that's, that's the goal that we're trying to aim for. Um, and so, but I mean, because the, the real power of what happens along this blue line here is that it's going to be something that's very similar to the way we'd imagine that um, a lot of the vernacular architecture forms emerge. So you can imagine how like the igloo emerged from something that, you know, was, was in a, a less, the more, ex less extreme latitude. And, you know, and I mean, it was probably very counterintuitive at first to think, oh, snow could actually be a good insulator, even though it's very cold. And, you know, gradually this, you know, but, but, you know, if someone just tries to dig under the ice, you get your heat flowing out. And so gradually over time through all this, like, process of trial and error that lasted centuries you eventually got the you know the igloo where you're sort of coming in and up and so that the heat gets trapped in there and you get these incredible properties and i mean and there are a lot of vernacular things evolved this way so i mean such as the the iranian ice house the yachtal um you know evolved this way uh you know from just people noticing that when they put the ice in underground that would stay for longer and this evolved in this big large system where you had a flat shallow pool to help you harvest the ice and then you are creating the ice and then you shaded it from the sun so all these I mean this is I mean there are there are countless other uh, examples of this perhaps a, a good um a good example of a modern one would be one of my favorite architects, this guy named Mike Reynolds, who after he was, uh, you know, disillusioned with some of the things he learned in architecture school, he, he sort of just went out to the, to the southwest uh, U.S. and just started building stuff and just building these crazy forms, mostly using waste streams from, from, the, from the U.S. And he had tried all these different things, all these, these, these different various combinations of, of the things in the waste stream. And over time, I mean, he went through this process of trial and error. I mean, sometimes he had so much glazing and his, and his you know, his buildings would wait, completely overheat when the sun came in through there. Um, but other times, you know, they were too deep and not enough, like, you know, not enough sun came in until this, he finally arrived at like kind of what is a modern vernacular. Um, where, you know, he had dimensions that made sense and he knew that, that he can control the temperature well if he, you know, if he kept the, the depth a bit constant. Uh, and that's, you know, that is what he termed an earth ship. And this, this took this man his entire life of experimenting and trial and error to arrive at this thing. And the power of energy simulation is that, is that you can get to this place, like this place that takes, normally takes centuries or, or you know, or at least a person's lifetime, you can get there in a matter of a month. Just, I mean, you can know that this building was going to overheat. You can know these things. And because of that, you can make some very, very powerful designs very, very quickly. And so if you guys are, I mean, so you have to invest a lot, but this is the huge payoff that you get out of this. And if you're, if you're in it for this type of thing, then, then this is the, the right video series and, and, uh, and you're gonna really enjoy what we have for you here. So, all right, so with that, with that preamble, you guys know what to expect in, in roughly in the series. Uh, and in the next one, we're just gonna talk about installation uh, of, of the tools. All right, I'll see you in the next one, guys.